Hi everyone. Today we need to talk a little bit about one of the key concepts from Joseph Harris's book rewriting, Coming to Terms. Since you read the introduction to his book for our first class, the basic term should be familiar to you. He explains that coming to terms means, quote, representing the work of others in ways that are both fair to them and useful to your own aims in writing. You can read the whole chapter on coming to terms through a perusal class, but in order to try and cut down on how much reading you have to do, I'm going to walk you through the principles and steps that Harris describes in the chapter, and when we meet together in class, we're going to use these concepts to help us understand the readings. You're going to want to take notes and not just listen to or watch this video, because there are going to be some key terms that you're going to want to keep at hand when we get to our discussions, so you don't have to come back and find them in this PowerPoint every time. So first, an overview. Coming to terms has a lot in common with summary, but it's the more advanced version of it. Summary is basically trying to condense down a text into a much smaller unit. By contrast, coming to terms is not necessarily about condensation, though it is usually involved. Instead, it's about making sure that we fully understand and describe not just what the author does, but how and why they do it in a particular way. We call this defining the author's project. One of the most important things about coming to terms, according to Harris, is the idea of the ethics of writing that he mentioned in the introduction. In coming to terms, we need to be generous or fair to the author, trying to understand things from their, their point of view, even when we maintain our own perspectives. Being generous means not attacking them for small slips in how they say things, but really focusing on the bigger ideas, methods, and purposes that they have. The final big thing about coming to terms to keep in mind is that it always has an end goal in mind that is bigger than summarizing. Coming to terms means that you're already also thinking about not just trying to represent what the author says, but how you are going to use and respond to the text. Now, this is an awful lot of different things to try and keep in balance. So what Harris does throughout the chapter is give you a series of questions you can ask to help you get a complete picture of how a text works and, and keep it in balance with your own ideas. So these are questions you can ask of any text to help you deeply read and understand. Even if when you actually start writing and using a text in your own work, you might not reference or answer all of them. So there are six different sets of questions and we're going to go through each one, um, but you're gonna wanna make sure you really learn these terms as we're gonna return to them throughout the semester. So they're aims, methods, materials, keywords and passages, and uses and limits. So let's get started. The first thing we, that we're going to think about when we're defining a project and coming to terms with it are the author's aims. Harris uses the word aims in part because it points out that what an author is trying to do and what they actually succeed at doing can be slightly different. We can't always know for sure what an author is trying to do, but if we want to be generous, we need to try and interpret the text based both on what they succeed at doing and on what they were trying to do, but maybe not doing so successfully. As you might guess, this is important to me as a teacher because of the idea of quality of failure. All right, so let's break down the idea of aims and think about how it helps us come to terms with uh, text a little bit better. The first thing you want to think about is audience. Who are you trying to reach or who is the author trying to reach? Every text has an audience and many texts have several different audiences. You're going to want to start with an author's explicit audience if they mention one, but sometimes there will be implicit audiences as well, as the author expects um, people to read the, a book or an article, uh, even if it's not directly aimed at them. Next, there's the question of what conversations an author is intervening in. Especially in academic writing, authors will usually signal the conversation they're responding to. There will be a moment, sometimes very early on, sometimes later, where they will say, here's what everyone else has been saying or doing about this issue. Harris does this himself when he talks about how previous textbooks had an approach that didn't make sense to him or that weren't enough for him. He saw their conversation and he wanted to make an intervention into it. So the third question, what problems or issues do they explore? Sometimes this is identical to the conversation or intervention, but not always. Um, this is not necessarily always the same thing as the topic or subject matter, though sometimes it is. Fourth is the position that the author wants to argue. The more complex the text, the more different things someone might think the author is arguing, but usually there will be one clear statement about the author's major position. It's worth noting, um, 
that an argument is never just a topic or subject. It's always a statement about the topic that other people could reasonably disagree with. We usually call this a thesis, um, but oftentimes a position might be bigger than just the thesis. It might be, uh, or it might have several different statements that are like a thesis. Fifth and finally, you want to ask, what is the author trying to achieve? And this is sometimes different from the position the author argues because it's really about why their position matters or what they want to happen if people are convinced of their position. This is the kind of thing that a writer will sometimes state explicitly. For example, Harris's introduction tells us what he's trying to achieve. Quote, I hope that is to help you write with perspicacity and wit about texts and issues that matter to you. He's very clear, not just that about what he wants to say about writing, but what the purpose of that argument or that position that he's taking is. And it's to help the reader do a specific thing that they couldn't do as well otherwise. So on to the second major question when it comes to coming to terms. What are the materials that the author uses? This is in many ways a more straightforward idea than aims. At the most basic level, you might just ask what points do they make in order to achieve their aim? Then you could go deeper and ask about their evidence and examples and the sources that they use. When you're coming to terms with a text, it's often easy to just catalog the specific materials a writer uses, making a list of them. So the real trick in coming to terms with an author's materials is not just to identify them, but to think about why they are using them. It's not enough to say that they quoted from a particular source. You need to think through why that source and that quotation were useful to your author. So think about why they use the materials, not just what materials they use. The third category that we want to look at is methods. Methods can mean a lot of different things in the context of writing, especially academic writing. First, consider whether the author invokes a specific theoretical framework. If an author signals that they're using a particular school of thought or following in a particular group, uh, following the work of a particular group, this is often a signal for their methods. You'll also want to think about the specific logic or the connections the author makes between the points that they have and the evidence or materials that they use. Is the author working with analogy or by deduction? How does the author get from one idea to another? And then they'll, um, after you look at the connections between the different ideas, you're going to want to also think about rhetoric or how the author connects their ideas to their audience. Rhetoric just means the art of persuasion. Um, it can include logic, so it might replicate what you're talking, looking at in the other methods, but it might also reference specific values that an audience holds or the particular emotions that they're trying to create in an audience. And we're going to come back and talk about rhetoric in a lot more detail later in the semester. Um, as you're answering all of these questions about aims, methods, and materials, you also need to be thinking about the keywords and passages that best illustrate your answers to those questions. For example, there's no way for me to describe coming to terms without using words like aims, methods, and materials, or even words like generous and fair. So the question is, what words and phrases are essential to accurately and, uh, and generously representing the text project? And sometimes you're also going to want to think about bigger chunks of text, not just a word or phrase, but a larger quotation, a full sentence or a paragraph that needs to be quoted in order to represent uh, a project carefully. How much you need to quote in terms of either individual words or larger passages really depends on your own use of the text in your own writing. The more important a text is to your project, the more you might quote, but also the more careful you have to be in distinguishing your voice from that of the source. And we'll talk about that act of quoting in a bit uh, more detail later on in the semester. The final two parts of coming to terms are assessing the uses and limits of the project that you're coming to terms with. This is really the point where you start to think concretely about the relationship of the text to your own ideas. Uses are the most generous component when you ask, what's good about this project? What's useful about the ideas, either in the past or present, or to someone reading what you are saying? How can someone build on the work that has already been done in the text that you're using? So what, what is it that's really valuable about the particular text? 
It's important that you ask this question before you get to limits. It's, it's very easy for most students to jump straight into criticism. We see flaws much more easily than we see what's good about something sometimes. But if we're faithful to the ethic that Harris lays out, we need to be careful to see the merits in a work before we start criticizing. This can also help with what's known as the backfire effect, and we'll get to that later in the semester as well. So um, one final uh, element of coming to terms, sorry, I didn't mention this earlier, is how can you apply this text in a particular way? That's another way of thinking about coming to terms. Um, so the other, the flip side of uses then is limits. There are three basic questions. What doesn't a text consider? Where could it have gone further than it did? And where could someone question what has been said? Now, these limits don't always have to be negative. This is your opportunity to be critical, but it's important to recognize that not all limits are failings of a text. For example, Harris describes some of his own limits, the things he doesn't have room to do in his book. He explains that his book is not a guide to research. There are other books that do that. He's not going to explain the nitty gritty details of how to cite. Sometimes authors just don't have room to discuss all the things they might want to or all the things their audience might want them to. They might be limited to a particular time period or a particular geography. But the great thing about limits, whether positive or negative, is that they offer places for you, or for someone at least, to add something. So let's go back to the beginning and review real quick, because um, these are the things that really need to stick in your head. Coming to terms is a way of understanding and describing an author's project that is both generous and critical. It becomes the basis for your own use of the text. You need to consider the author's aims, methods, and materials, all while representing them accurately through at least a few of their own keywords and passages. And then you need to think about how their ideas are useful or limited or both. So when you come to class, expect me to ask about these specific things with any of the readings that you were assigned. This is oftentimes the framework that I will use to structure our class conversation when we're looking through reading. Um, when you're annotating the text, you can be looking for these specific things. All right, I'll see you guys in class.